Heidi Ho Neighborinos. We did a little Ned Flanders intro there today, but I am here with Alex from Podcast Now, who is a very, very good friend of mine. He makes all kinds of wonderful content on multiple channels. He's got Podcast Now, Podcast Now Plus. The links to those are in the description down below. I know, like me on my Let's Play channel, Degenerate Plays, which I always urge you to check out, Podcast Now has now started uh, its channel memberships and is doing a great job with that. So lots of different ways to support Alex, including social media and other stuff. Alex, thank you for being here. And also, you know what? In a little wholesome moment, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for having me. Uh, as always, I love, uh, I have been getting more into the topic, I guess, of, uh, you know, like backwards compatible, been playing some, I don't go back as far as you, but like the early 2010s, late 2000s uh, is my era that I'm kind of in right now. But yeah, thank you for having me. And uh, well, same back to you, man. Thank you for being my friend as well. Absolutely. I just needed a little reassurance today of my value. So I wanted to put the ball in your court there. Uh, with backwards compatibility, this is such a touchy subject because I want to say first, Alex and I are not dogging on or, or you know, really trying to take shots at any platforms with this. Uh, we want to look at this as people who own these platforms. Like, we own Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo. We're just gamers. We enjoy all of them. And that's not a shot at anyone who doesn't own them all. It's just, we like all of them. I mean, I even have a gaming PC. So... When it comes down to it, I like game preservation. I want games to be available for future people. If I want my son or daughter to sit down and enjoy Batman Arkham City with me and have a fun time, I want them to have a good way to do that, you know, and be able to enjoy that. And backwards compatibility is such a frustrating topic for me because I feel like it's something that's gone by the wayside completely. And now... It's even more frustrating because I think it's being monetized. Backwards compatibility is now, it's now a monetized feature instead of an expectation. And back in the day, it was always an expectation. The PS2 came out, it could play PS1 games. It essentially could just emulate them inside the machine. The PS3 came out and originally it could play PS1 and PS2 games. Then they had a problem with that and they ditched PS2, uh, which was frustrating to me, but yeah, apparently it needed to be done to get that console to work right. Then you had the 360, and it, it came out, and it had problems with Xbox backwards compatibility. They tried to fix it later on, but it was horrible. But now we're at the point, you know, where you have basically, I mean, even to throw one other example out there, one of the most ludicrous examples of going above and beyond was the Nintendo DS. It had a slot dedicated for Game Boy Advance games and stuff like that. But now we never see that anymore. And it's it's such a sad situation to me with game preservation where I feel like Xbox is trying because they don't have tons of exclusives and it helps them sell their platform and, and do stuff. And I do appreciate what they've done there with backwards compatibility and FPS boost enhancing things. But then now you have PlayStation and Nintendo with switch almost making backwards compatibility, a membership thing that you have to pay for really in, in a lot of ways. And I don't know, I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on all this because it really leaves me in a state of frustration where I want people to be able to play games and enjoy them. And just because it came out on a, a piece of tech earlier, I don't think that should block them out. It never does with PC. So I'm I'm frustrated that it's just acceptable in the console market of, well, it is what it is, you know, because I, I really don't think it has to be that way. I was shocked when the PS5 came out and could play PS4 games. I shouldn't be shocked about that. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, and, 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 You've always been, and to to your credit, you've always been somebody to push this and to be on the side of you know having uh, game preservation basically. And as time has gone on, I, I think I always uh, have been, and not just not as much. And I think as time has gone on, I've become more and more into it because you're right. It's it's basically it's almost like what we did on like my uh, the the podcast that we did, where it's like a society thing, where society has basically told us that these consoles don't need to do it, and then when they do it. Uh, you know, they do it for the subscription service and then you're like judging it because of the service and you're saying, well, they really need to add more games for the service, but you're only, you know what I mean? You're judging like a small portion of it and you're not taking those couple steps backwards to realize, wait a second, how did we get here? How did we get where these became 
services instead of exactly what you said how do we get where it became services instead of they are just built into the console and xbox has done it you know better and playstation is catching up and doing a, a much better job for the ps5 and then the subscription but again like it's just it's in the subscription and i do think the subscription services are getting better and there is a sense of like caring more about past games but it's it's basically been hijacked, I would maybe say, right? Where it's like, well, this is a way of selling our subscription service, where if you get PlayStation Plus, right, or you get the premium, the highest edition, 120 a year, which I just renewed actually a couple weeks ago. Um, you know, you get the, the, uh, the older, the classics, the PS1, PS2, and it's like, well... Now, again, we're judging it now on, well, they need to add more PS2 games to make the service more, uh, more worth it, right? More worth the money. And it's like, well, why haven't, why wasn't it just part of it in the first place? I don't know. I don't know if it was like super forward thinking where they knew they could strip you of these things and then sell it back to you. It, almost like Madden, right? You can strip away the entirety of Madden and then put the modes back in over time and just uh, acknowledge it as something different, like the mode never existed in the first place, and maybe people won't notice. And if you just take a couple steps back, you'll say, wait a second, you know, Madden 06 had, like, all of these, and then you stripped them away, and now you're kind of at, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it, it probably, to be honest with you, though, is a society thing. It's more a society thing where we've kind of just accepted that this is the way, literally, like Mandalorian, and uh, and we've just kind of fallen in line. And, uh, and I, I do think... The idea of game preservation, because it hasn't been all that big, it's kind of allowed people to fall into that. Like even me, again, like I'm, I'm, I wasn't too big into. I always support. Like if you asked me, I would say, yeah, that's important. But I never did anything about it. You know, what I mean, I think a lot of people are like that, or just literally only want a digital, don't care about old stuff. They only care about what's new. And when you have enough of those people, you can get away with stripping things and 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 hoping that people don't see it because a lot of people almost naturally did it on their own. Sports games are a great observation on that, because I, I do think there's a lot of similarities. And, and to what you said, old games are part of my religion. Yeah, so in, yeah. In, terms of, in terms of this kind of stuff, I guess I wanted to ask you a question, and it's something I've noticed to speak to the society element of this, because I will say first, people ask, why is it important? Well, it's because there's a lot of games that I don't think... I really don't think any game should just be seen as a disposable experience. And this is going to lead into my, my question for you. And I feel like we have hit the point where everything is a disposable experience. You know, like you're not expected to buy a physical movie anymore because you can just watch it on Netflix. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, unless you're like an audio file or anything like that, where you care that the audio is slightly worse or that the pixels are slightly worse because it's streamed, I guess there really isn't a problem with it technically, except for the fact that those things can always be taken away from you. So my problem yeah. with this, this disposability, it has not only leaked into backwards compatibility, it's leaked into game design. You look at sports games, you look at shooters, there are features that are unavailable a couple of years after their launch a lot of times, like because... They just, they're not supported anymore. So you look at NBA 2K, that's, it's a good example for me. I think since 2019 or 2020, I don't remember which year, my career is, it's just an online thing. It never was that. And when the services go down, so does that content. It's still, it's still the same game you paid for, but a bunch of it is no longer available. And to me, that kind of stuff is frustrating because you've had this, this disposability it's leaked into everything. Movies, they only have to be impressive and good for right now. It's a spectacle, uh, but it doesn't need to hold up later. Same with games. It needs to be impressive for right now, but nobody's going to go back and play this in 10 years. And I, I think that those kinds of things, to me, why are we bothering then? Like, why are we bothering to make these if everything's disposable, everything doesn't matter later on? And my other problem with that, too, is then you also have long-running franchises that are the opposite. I would argue a franchise like Assassin's Creed, yeah, you can jump in wherever you want, sure, but there have been big, huge story arcs, like Assassin's Creed 1, 2, Brotherhood Revelations, and 3, and 4, I would argue, are a huge story arc about the, the group called the Isu, and I'm getting to a point with this. Now, that, that lore still comes up in modern-day games that they make, but if you're on PlayStation, unless you're wanting to use some really bad streaming or do something like that, um, you're not going to play Assassin's Creed 1. Because like I said in, in my video about the remake for that franchise, 
It's been FPS boosted on Xbox Series X. It's been 4K patched, looking incredible for an, for an older game. And it has so much going for it, but then no one cared on PlayStation. You know, and there's a lot of examples of this throughout franchises of things that never made the jump, but maybe a sequel did, or things that never made the jump, and now we're just reusing ideas from a game you could have played 10 years ago, but you don't know any better because you don't have access to that. There's no reason if I'm EA or 2K to want you, Alex, to go back to a game from 2007 because you might think it's better than what we're doing now. So if I make yeah. that not accessible to you, that's better for me. I guess I kind of want your thoughts on that because this whole disposable idea yeah, and you know it's almost kylo ren let the past die kill it if you have to we don't want them going back and looking at it it is so infinitely frustrating to me because you have these franchises built on the past and then you also have ones that are just ignorant of their past and, and want it to go away so that they can monetize it yeah well it's frustrating like um you know i've been going back playing games and I want to do Dragon Age at some point. Now, I played, and I, I, I don't think I finished 1 and 2, and I, but I did play all the way through Inquisition. Now, Inquisition's easy, right? Very m many ways of playing Inquisition now. Very few ways of, of playing 1 and 2. And, uh, and again, yeah, it kind of goes into that. It's like, why do you have Inquisition available if you're not going to keep up with the rest of them? Because it's, you know, people want to play, I think, uh, the trilogy there. And, and then you have, like, the... The push for like a remat. Well, then it's do, do a collection, do Mass Effect because you know for a long time Mass Effect was like that where you couldn't do one through three. So it, I, I don't know, maybe it is some sort of devious plan where they they want it like sports games, like we said, with kind of like stripping things and hoping you don't notice. Maybe it's a way of like, well, we won't bring them, we won't continue them, we won't bring them to the next console like Assassin's Creed One, but we'll do a remake and you pay us sixty more dollars and you can get it again, even though it's a it will be a better game and. I would probably like to play an Assassin's Creed 1 remake over Assassin's Creed 1, but the, the principle is, still, you know what I mean? It's still the same principle of, well, we'll do that instead. And you have that as an industry. That's the entire industry is like that. And uh, I don't know, like, again, uh, something like a Dragon Age is like, well, I'll have to do that on Xbox or on PC because I just can't do it on PlayStation. Um, and again, they're, I mean, they're getting better. Like, I'm playing some Assassin's Creed games on PlayStation, and they're not bad. But again, with Xbox, with, like, the boosting and stuff, um, probably would be better to do it on Xbox. It's tough. It's tough. And it's, it's more annoying the more you get into that world, which I really, again, haven't been for all that long, but I'm, I'm more into it. And some of my favorite games of all time are old. Oh, and that's, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll end my thoughts on that, that comment of, um, you know, like lasting a long time. Like I get you make games probably in the moment. And I, you know, for every blockbuster game or movie, you always hear people say, well, we didn't know it was going to be big, right? You always hear people say, we didn't know it was going to explode like that. But if, if you do things just for the present, then yeah, I feel like that's, that's like, I guess if you only care about the year 2022, well, yeah, I mean, in 10 years, people may still be playing like a Sly Cooper. There's a reason Sly Cooper has, you know, held up and there's a reason that people still play it, even though Sony doesn't care to continue it, right? But you have those things and uh, you can bring even Assassin's Creed. There's something kind of special, in my opinion, to the original couple. And, you know, even as you go further from there, but then you think to, you know, like Odyssey and Valhalla, they're 200 plus hours, but they're very much made for like the present year. Are we really going to go back and play Odyssey in 2032? Like, is that going to be something we want to do is go back and play? Or will we still want to play the Ezio collection, even though it'll be absolutely awful? Like visually, will we still want to do it? Um, I don't know the answer. It's probably no. I would lean towards no, though. These games now are just kind of made with a different heart uh, than they were. I, maybe that sounds, I don't know, does that sound old of me? No. I think there's plenty There's plenty of amazing games now. That's the difference between me and some of the, I don't know, hot take people that you always see on YouTube that say, oh, there's nothing good out. You know, like they always, and Jay, you, I think you may know who I'm talking about, these certain groups, I won't say them, but you know, when you always hear people say like, there's nothing good out, it's just because they're not looking hard enough. I can name you 20 great games that came out this year. But you can have that blend. I can say there's 20 great games this year, but also there's just something different about a lot of games that are released now versus back then. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think a lot of it is disposability. A lot of it is the idea, like you said, made for now. And to kind of, you know, you have to get going here in a couple minutes. So I'm going to wrap this yep. up and, and, you know, let you respond one more time and then we'll kind of be done. But I think that with a lot of that stuff too, to in a, in a closing thought from me, you have fear of missing out. You have FOMO, which is a huge thing. So you have Destiny 2 vaulting DLCs, you know, content that you paid for 
just kind of going away. Uh, you have things like World of Warcraft. I know people love it, but it was a big problem as that got bigger. Uh, you did more and more expansions and the old ones didn't really matter anymore. You know, they were just relegated to the past and didn't matter. And and you have all these games like that. And then you have games too, where I would ask you this, you know, if you are making Assassin's Creed, it, it's such a good example. If you're making Odyssey and Valhalla, and let's say you told me they're going to be better every time we make it. Well, when you do that kind of stuff, to me, it kind of, it almost pushes a reasoning too of like, well, why should I play Odyssey then? Why don't I wait for Valhalla and just play the better experience? You know, so yeah. like you, you also put gamers in positions where it's like sports fans, especially there's tons of them that skip years because why wouldn't you? These stories, these, these worlds, these games and, and how they play these things, I think they're bigger than just a tiny distraction. They, they mean a lot to people. You and I, I uh, talked on Twitter a little bit about the person who had talked about how they decided not to exit the planet uh, by self-inflicted means because they started playing Assassin's Creed 4. You know, what yeah. if somebody could have that same experience in 10 years, but they can't because backwards compatibility has gone, stuff like that. It's not to be like, you're killing people or anything crazy like that. I'm not trying to like, you know, be a, be a nut job here, but I'm just saying these experiences are very important to people. They connect with people emotionally. And yes, maybe some of them don't. Maybe some of them are more the popcorn, which I love popcorn, uh, flick, you know, or movie of, of the movie industry or of the game industry. But when you have all this stuff designed for now and DLC designed for now, where say maybe you go back to Valhalla in 10 years and you can't download certain costumes or can't do this or can't do that, that kind of made for now stuff that will either make games worse later or make them unavailable. I think it's rather unfortunate because I think it undersells what video games and what movies and what books and all these other things, what they really mean to people. They can change their lives in really interesting ways, um, whether these companies realize that or not. And I think a lot of them, they don't care about that aspect anymore because it's not really about the art. Uh, since the gaming industry exploded, you know, there's more money to be made now. You don't see as many passion projects unless it's indie. You don't see as many chances where money could be lost because the the net gain possibilities are way higher and the net loss possibilities are way uh, higher than they were back in the day where, you know, everybody was not making a ton of money to make a really good game. It's become more greed, more money and uh, more products like wanting to get more things out and because of that you lose you do i mean to simplify it you lose a little bit of the heart behind you know making games for uh quote unquote like the right reasons but yeah i, I agree with everything you said so anyway let us know what you think in the comments down below please be sure to leave a like and subscribe for more content i appreciate you very much i appreciate alex for being here he had to run to grab his daughter from uh from school so i appreciate him and i hope he has a fantastic day and i appreciate all of you as well for watching Please let us know what you think in the comments down below. Leave a like if you enjoyed this. Subscribe and check out Alex's channels, Podcast Now and Podcast Now Plus. We are excited to keep growing, keep doing stuff together. And as the years go on, I'm sure that will keep on happening. We have launched a membership feature over on Degenerate Plays that I hope you'll check out. We have tons of fun hanging out over there. Uh, my wife and I, my friends and I playing games, doing stuff. And we're going to be having different guests and different people in some Let's Plays over the next a year here as well that will be very very entertaining and interesting and fun for us and hopefully for you and i'm excited to keep going so appreciate you very much have a fantastic day and as always everyone stay shway